Baal was the name of the god who was worshipped throughout Canaan and Phoenicia in ancient times. During the Judges period, the practice of Baal worship entered Jewish religious life. Judges chapter 3 verse 7, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The practice of Baal worship became widespread in Israel during the reign of Ahab. 1 Kings chapter 16 verses 31 through 33 And as though it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians, and he began to bow down in worship of Baal. First, Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. And the practice of Baal worship also affected Judah. Second Chronicles chapter 28, verses 1-4, through 4, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and also made idols for worshipping the Baals. The plural of the word Baal is Baalim, which means Lord. Baal was a fertility god who was thought to help the earth produce crops and people produce offspring in general. Various parts worshipped Baal in different methods, and Baal proved to be a highly universal god. Various locales highlighted one or another of his attributes and designed special sects of Baalism. Baal of Peor, as we see in Numbers chapter 25 and Baal Bereth, as we see in Judges chapter 8 verse are two examples of such localized deities. Numbers chapter 25 verse 3. In this way, Israel joined in the worship of Baal of Peor, causing the Lord's anger to blaze against his people. Judges chapter 8 verse 33. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Bereth as their god. The word Baal appears infrequently in the Old Testament as a personal name. The word's etymology shows that Baal was considered as the owner of a certain location, thereby limiting its use to individuals who were no longer nomads but had settled down. These local Baals were thought to be in charge of agriculture, creatures, and humanity's fertility. It was crucial to win their favor, especially in a place like Pal, where there are few natural streams or springs and rainfall is unpredictable. This led to the adoption of extreme forms in the cultus, including the practice of ritual prostitution and child sacrifice. Judges chapter 2 verse 17, New King James Version. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. Amos chapter 10 verse 7, New King James Version. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 9, New King James Version. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know? The Baal eventually ascended to the position of preeminent deity in the region. Part of this process, according to some researchers, can be traced back to the Ugaritic scriptures. Baal is identified as the son of Dagon, another Amorite deity. At Rosh Shamra, the ancient Ugarit site, temples to Baal and Dagon have been uncovered, but none devoted to El himself. Baal is depicted in the scriptures wearing a helmet embellished with a bull's horns, a symbol of strength and fertility. He holds a club or mace in one hand, probably representing thunder, and a spear adorned with leaves in the other possibly representing both lightning and vegetation. In Aramean sculptures, Baal is depicted riding a bull, which may be related to Aaron and Jeroboam I's calf images, which were most likely used as pedestals for the invisible Yahweh. Anath, referred to euphemistically as the Virgin Anath, was Baal's spouse and sister and shared many of his escapades. The Day of the Lord may have originated as a celebration of Yahweh's victory over the forces of chaos, presumably at the New Year festival in the Jerusalem temple, in a rite derived from a Canaanite predecessor. There is evidence that Baal and other Canaanite deities were worshipped in Egypt but without becoming a serious threat to the native Egyptian religion. The situation was different in Israel, where, through the processes of syncretism, 
the worship of Yahweh was profoundly influenced and threatened by alien elements from the Baal cults. This was due to two main factors. First, the Israelites did not drive out the Canaanites, but intermarried with them, thus raising the problem of the interrelationship of Yahweh and Baal. Second, Yahweh had given Israel a considerable victory over the Canaanites, and his supremacy was unquestioned. Baal was considered the most powerful of all gods, eclipsing El, who was seen as rather weak and ineffective. In various battles, Baal defeated Yom, the god of the sea, and Mot, the god of death and the underworld. Baal's sisters, or consorts, were Ashtoreth, a fertility goddess associated with the stars, and Anath, a goddess of love and war. The Canaanites worshipped Baal as the sun god and as the storm god, he is usually depicted holding a lightning bolt, who defeated enemies and produced crops. They also worshipped him as a fertility god who provided children. Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and involved ritualistic prostitution in the temples. At times, appeasing Baal required human sacrifice, usually the firstborn of the one making the sacrifice. Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 5, KJV They have built also the high places of Baal, to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Baal's priests worshipped their deity with riotous rites that featured ecstatic shouts and self-inflicted harm. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 28 So the prophets prayed louder and cut themselves with knives and daggers, according to their ritual, until blood flowed. Before the Hebrews entered the Promised Land, the Lord God forewarned against glorifying Canaan's gods, but Israel bent to idolism anyway. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 14-15, through 15, King James Version Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Prophet Elijah During the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, at the height of Baal worship in Israel, God directly confronted the paganism through his prophet Elijah. First, God showed that he, not Baal, controlled the reign by sending a drought lasting three and one-half years. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, NKJV And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except at my word. Now Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. Allow me to introduce you to the three main characters in this incredible Bible story. The first is Ahab, the king of Israel, who did more evil than all the previous kings combined. The second character is Jezebel, Ahab's wife she decided to replace the Lord God's worship with worship of Baal. Elijah, one of God's great prophets, is the third character. His name translates as Jehovah is my God. While Jezebel was destroying the people and places associated with the true God, the Lord sent a man whose name testified that the Lord Jehovah was his God. Elijah then went public. He set up a meeting with King Ahab. Three years had passed since Elijah declared that there would be no rain. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17, New King James Version. Then it happened, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? The king was still enraged and referred to Elijah as the troubler of Israel. But Elijah was unfazed, telling the king, I'm not the troublemaker, you are. The stage was set for a showdown on Mount Carmel between 850 Baal prophets and one God prophet. How long will you waver between two opinions? Elijah challenged the audience. If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Here was Elijah's dare. Let's have a competition. Let the God who is God respond with fire from heaven. That was a reasonable test. Baal, the storm god, should be able to send down some lightning. Elijah gave them every advantage before mocking their futile efforts. Baal's prophets spent hours pleading, shouting, and cutting themselves, but he didn't respond. Then Elijah prepared the sacrifice before asking God to show the people his glory. 
fire fell and consumed the sacrifice, the water, and the altar as soon as he said his prayer. People fell to their knees, yelling, The Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. They couldn't help but notice that God was alive and well. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground, and put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked, and said, There is nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud, as small as a man's hand, rising out of the sea. So he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot, and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. But the Lord wasn't done yet. He reactivated the rain spigot. Elijah prayed seven times in a row before the rain began to fall. Elijah, drenched, dashed down the mountain. He demonstrated that God is alive and well. You can demonstrate it both privately and publicly in your life. Confrontations with the Pharisees over the source of Jesus' miraculous power. Finally, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 27, Jesus refers to Satan as Beelzebub, a reference to the Philistine god Baalzebub. Matthew chapter 12, verse 27, And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 27. Then some people brought a man to Jesus. This man was blind and could not talk, because he had a demon. Jesus healed the man, and the man could talk and see. All the people were amazed. They said, Perhaps this man is the son of David. The Pharisees heard the people saying this. The Pharisees said, Jesus uses the power of Beelzebul to force demons out of people. Beelzebul is the ruler of demons. Jesus knew what the Pharisees were thinking. So he said to them, Every kingdom that is fighting against itself will be destroyed, and every city that is divided will fall, and every family that is divided cannot succeed. So if Satan forces out his own demons, then Satan is divided, and his kingdom will not continue. You say that I use the power of Satan when I force out demons. If that is true, then what power do your people use when they force out demons? So your own people prove that you are wrong. Jesus defends his ministry with two short parables before launching into two vehement attacks of the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 12, verses 30-37 through 37. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in his age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit, brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. 37. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. First, the power behind an exorcism could come from either God or Satan. Since the Pharisees have already concluded that Jesus is not God's agent, they cite the source of his power as Satan. They believe that because a demon has sprung from the man, it must be proof that the demon is obeying Satan as the demon's king. However, Jesus demonstrates how absurd their thinking is. If Satan wants to keep his grip on the world, he won't work against himself by exercising a demon in control of someone. That would be in direct opposition to his own attempt to preserve international dominance. They are concrete evidence that the kingdom of God has arrived, since Satan's reign is being defeated by Jesus's. The Spirit of God, not Beelzebul, is the power behind Jesus' deliverance. Jesus continues his response to the Pharisees' charge that he cast out demons by Beelzebul with a second short parable. 
Or again, how can anyone enter a strongman's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strongman? Then he can rob his house. Entering a well-guarded house, the residence of Satan and his demonic henchmen, and stealing the owner's property is how Jesus describes his role in inaugurating the kingdom. Before Jesus can free individuals who have been imprisoned through exorcism, he must first bind Satan. Because of the coming of the kingdom of God, Jesus proclaims that Satan's strength is now restricted. Who was Asherah? Ashtoreth. In the Bible, Asherah or Ashtoreth is a name of a pagan fertility goddess and the wooden cult object devoted to her. In the Bible, Asherah is almost always referred to as a sacred pole erected in honor of the fertility goddess. Scripture also references carved images of Asherah. He made a carved image of the goddess Asherah and set it up in the house, temple, 2 Kings chapter 21 verse 7. The name Asherah means she who enriches. In Ugaritic literature, she was called Lady Asherah of the Sea. She was believed to be worshipped in ancient Syria, Phoenicia, and Canaan. She was worshipped by the Phoenicians as Astarte, the Assyrians as Ishtar, and the Philistines as Asherah. 1 Samuel chapter 31 verse 10 And they put Saul's weapons and armor in the temple of the Ashtoreth, female goddesses, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. As soon as Joshua died, Asherah worship plagued Israel due to Israel's incomplete conquest of Canaan. Judges chapter 2 verse 13 So they abandoned the Lord and served Baal, the pagan god of the Canaanites, and the Ashtoreth. The nation of Israel was in a state of compromise in Judges 1. Initially, they had fought the pagan culture of the Canaanites. Then they feared it, and then they coexisted with it peacefully. Some might say that this was only a little disobedience compared to everything God had commanded. Still, God does not consider minor disobedience regarding his precise commands. God commanded his people for their good, and he wanted complete obedience. What would motivate them to compromise and disobey God's clear commands? Judges 2 gives the reason. Every generation faces either degeneration or regeneration. We must pay attention to this message. Our generation and the next must consider this question. Will the generation degenerate or regenerate? Judges 2 discusses Asherah. The first five verses of Judges 2 reveal the Lord lovingly confronting his people about their compromise. Despite Israel's unfaithfulness, the Lord affirmed his faithfulness. God is faithful to keep his promises to us, even when we desert the Lord and are unfaithful to him. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13 If we are faithless, he remains faithful, true to his word and his righteous character, for he could not deny himself. People are always called to be different by God. It was God's standard for Israel to be different from the nations around them, but they had not obeyed. Sin always hurts. It always shackles. Joshua had faith in God and believed in his promises. Because of the leadership of Joshua, his generation knew the Lord. However, generations come and go. The new generation didn't know God. The nation began with incomplete obedience and compromise. Instead of driving out the Canaanites, they were affected by that heathen nation's perverse pagan worship. Baal was the harvest god, and Ashtoreth was the fertility goddess. Canaanite religion was tolerant and had no problem with someone worshipping their gods and the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said he alone was to be worshipped. Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 
you shall have no other gods before me. The people had a choice. In time, Israel caved. God eventually stopped driving the judged nations out of the land and left them to test his people. Asherah was characterized by a limbless tree trunk planted in the ground. The trunk was typically carved into a symbolic representation of the goddess. As a result of the connection with carved trees, the places of Asherah worship were commonly called groves. He placed the carved Asherah pole he had made in the temple among King Manasseh's evil acts. 2 Kings chapter 21 verse 7 Considered the moon goddess, Asherah was often presented as a consort of Baal the sun god. Judges chapter 6 verse 28 Early the next morning when the men of the city got up, they discovered that the altar of Baal was torn down and the Asherah which was beside it was cut down and the second bull was offered on the altar which had been built. Judges chapter 10 verse 6 then the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They served the Baals, the Ashtoreth, female deities, the gods of Aram, Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. They abandoned the Lord and did not serve him. Asherah was also worshipped as the goddess of love and war and was sometimes linked with Anath, another Canaanite goddess. The cult of Asherah was notorious for its sensuality and involved ritual prostitution. In addition to this, divination and telling fortunes were also practices that the priests and priestesses of Asherah carried out. In the Old Testament, the word Asherah is mentioned 40 times were 33 of these occurrences referring to the sacred Ashura poles used in pagan and heretical Israelite worship. There are only seven occurrences of the name Ashura that refer to the goddess herself. A detailed description of Ashura or an Ashura pole is not provided in the Old Testament, nor is the origin of Ashura worship described. In Canaan, Sacred sites and altars were adorned with Asherah poles. 1 Kings chapter 14 verse 23 For they also built for themselves high places to worship idols, and sacred pillars and Asherah, for the goddess Asherah. These were on every high hill and under every luxuriant tree. The city of Tyre on the Mediterranean coast was home to the best cedars of Lebanon, and was an important center for worshiping Asherah. From Israel's inception, God commanded his people not to worship idols or any other false gods. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 7 You shall have no other gods before me. Intermarrying with pagan nations and practicing pagan worship were forbidden for the Hebrews. Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 12 and you will know, without any doubt, that I am the Lord. For you have not walked in my statutes, nor have you executed my ordinances, but you have acted in accordance with the ordinances of the nations around you. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 15 They rejected his statutes and his covenant which he made with their fathers, as well as his warnings that he gave them and they followed vanity, that is, false gods, idols, and became vain, empty-headed. They followed the pagan practices of the nations which surrounded them, although the Lord had commanded that they were not to do as they did. God warned Israel not to worship Canaan's gods before they entered the Promised Land. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 14 through 15 you shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous, impassioned God, demanding what is rightfully and uniquely His. 
Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled and burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the earth. The Jewish law explicitly forbade reverence of Asherah. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 21. You shall not plant for yourself an Asherah of any kind of tree or wood beside the altar of the Lord your God, which you shall make. Judges chapter 6 verse 26 depicts the collapse of an Asherah pole by using it to fuel the fire of a sacrificial offering to the Lord. Judges chapter 6 verse 26 And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this mountain stronghold, with stones laid down in an orderly way. Then take the second bull, and offer a burnt sacrifice using the wood of the Asherah which you shall cut down. When Asa reigned in Judah, he expelled the male cult prostitutes, sodomites from the land, and removed all the idols that his fathers, Solomon, Rehoboam, and Abijam had made. He also deposed his great-grandmother Maacah from being queen mother, because she had made a horrid, obscene vulgar image for the goddess Asherah. Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it by the brook Kidron. 1 Kings chapter 15 verses 12 through 13. The Lord had given the Jews the command to demolish and remove all of the high places and sacred sites across the territory. But Israel disobeyed God and continued to worship idols even introducing the cult of Asherah into the temple in Jerusalem. Ahab transferred 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah into Israel so the people could worship the pagan gods that belonged to his wife Jezebel. 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 18 through 19 Elijah said, I have not brought disaster on Israel, but you and your father's household have, by abandoning, rejecting the commandments of the Lord and by following the Baals. Now then, send word and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah, who eat at Queen Jezebel's table. A famous Asherah pole stood in Samaria in the days of King Jehoaz. 2 Kings chapter 13 verse 6 Yet they did not turn from the idolatrous sins of the royal house of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin, but walked in them. And the Asherah, set up by Ahab, also remained standing in Samaria, Israel's capital. Manasseh, king of Judah, heeded the despicable practices of the pagan nations. He reconstructed the high places and set up altars for Baal and an Asherah pole. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced sorcery and divination, and even made a carved image of Asherah and set it up in the temple. 2 Kings chapter 21 verse 7 He made a carved image of the goddess Asherah, and set it up in the house, temple. During the reign of Josiah, the high priest Hilkiah cleansed the temple of all images depicting the goddess Asherah. One reason Israel fell to the Assyrians was God's anger over the worship of Asherah and Baal. Despite God's clear instructions, Asherah worship was a perennial problem in Israel. As Solomon slipped into idolatry, one of the pagan deities he brought into the kingdom was Asherah, called the goddess of the Sidonians. 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 5 For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the fertility goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the horror, detestable idol of the Ammonites. 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 33 Because they have abandoned me, and a worshipped Ashtor, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon. And they have not walked in my ways and followed my commandments, doing what is right in my sight, 
and keeping my statutes and my ordinances as did his father David. At times, Israel experienced a revival, and King Josiah led notable crusades against Asherah worship. 2 Kings chapter 23 verse 4 Then the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, and the priests of the second rank, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal, for the goddess Asherah, and for all the starry host of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron, and carried their ashes to Bethel, where Israel's idolatry began. The gods of the Old Testament were nothing more than demons masquerading as gods. Who was Dagon? The Bible describes Dagon, also known as Dagon, as one of the oldest deities of Mesopotamia, with evidence dating back to 3000 BC, and he was represented as a half-man, half-fish creature. The god Dagon was regarded as the father of all other gods, so he was worshipped widely in what we call the Cradle of Civilization, where farming is thought to have first started, also the area some call the Fertile Crescent. Dagon's statue looked like a gigantic man. Some representations of him have him looking like a merman, which is a human with fish features below the waist. Some scholars have referred to him as a fish god, which makes sense given his association with the Philistines and their location along the coast. In the Bible, the Philistines continued to worship Dagon during the time of the Judges, as well as during the reigns of Samuel and Saul. As a biblical connection, ancient texts from the region connect Dagon as the father of Baal. What happened to Dagon in the Bible? There are two primary passages in the Old Testament that make reference to Dagon. The story can be found in Judges chapter 16 as a component of the Samson narrative. God chose Samson to be one of the deliverers or judges and he used his renowned power to triumph over the Philistines at every stage of the conflict. The Philistines were unable to defeat him in combat, so they targeted his Achilles heel, his relationships with foreign women. The famed Delilah coaxed Samson's secret confession out of him and made him cut off his hair leading him to be taken captive by the Philistines. As they worshipped Dagon and had a big party, they decided to humiliate Samson by putting out his eyes and making him work as a slave. Clearly, this was part of their worship of Dagon. Judges chapter 16 verses 23 and 24 Now the Philistine lords gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their god, and to celebrate, for they said, Our God has given Samson our enemy into our hands. When the people saw Samson, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has handed over our enemy to us, the ravager of our country who has killed many of us. When nations went to war in polytheistic cultures, it was also understood that their gods fought, and the Old Testament confirms this in many passages with Israel and other cultures. With Samson, the Philistines were making a statement. Due to the capture of Samson, they believed Dagon had beaten Jehovah, Samson's god, and therefore Dagon was stronger than the god of Israel. Judges chapter 16 verses 25 to 30. Now when they were in high spirits, they said, Call for Samson, so that he may amuse us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. Then Samson said to the boy who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the roof of the house rests, so that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the Philistine lords were there and on the flat roof were about three thousand men and women who looked on while Samson was entertaining them. 
Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this one time. O God, and let me take vengeance on the Philistines for my two wives. Samson took hold of the two middle support pillars on which the house rested and braced himself against them, one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he stretched out with all his might, collapsing the support pillars. And the house fell on the Lord's and on all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Samson's plea to God to help him destroy the Philistines makes sense. God's assistance was not about Samson so much as proving which God was stronger. 1 Samuel chapter 5 is where we find the next instance of Dagon being dealt with. The sons of Eli the priest and commander of Israel were wicked religious men. And despite the fact that the Ark of the Covenant went into battle with Israel against the Philistines, God handed Israel a defeat as punishment. The Philistines succeeded in stealing the Ark of the Covenant from its previous owners in a manner identical to that which had occurred with Samson. The Philistines brought the Ark into the temple of one of their city-states, Ashdod. 1 Samuel chapter 5 verses 1 to 7. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God, and they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. They took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon, and set it beside the image of Dagon, their chief idol. When the people of Ashdod got up early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and returned him to his place. But when they got up early the next morning, behold, Dagon had again fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and his head and both palms of his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk portion of the idol of Dagon was left on him. This is the reason neither the priests of Dagon nor any who entered Dagon's house step on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. Then the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he caused them to be dumbfounded and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. When the men of Ashdod saw what had happened, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. As a mark of their success, they displayed the ark by placing it at the base of the massive statue of Dagon. Dagon had beat Jehovah, right? It didn't last long. Then they sent the ark to the city of Ekron. You guessed correctly. More people developed tumors and passed away as a result. The people of Philistia pleaded with their officials to return the ark to Israel, and their leaders complied with their request pointing out that they shouldn't be as obstinate as Pharaoh had been in Egypt. They loaded the ark onto a cart that was driven by two animals, and then they set it out. The oxen eventually made it back to Israel, even though there was no one driving them. Despite the worldview of the Philistines, the defeat of Israel wasn't a defeat of their God. God didn't need the army of Israel to fight for him. He won all on his own. It seems as if God has a sense of humor when we read the story of Dagon in the Bible. Here and in Isaiah, we see how God deals with false worship twice, when he speaks of cutting wood for a fire and then bowing down to it. In the Isaiah excerpt, God said, He feeds on ashes, a deluded heart has led him astray. And he cannot deliver himself or say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? How was Dagon worshipped? Dagon was worshipped in temples that could be found all over Mesopotamia. According to the Bible, the cities of Beth Dagon, Gaza, and Ashdod 
were home to some of the most important temples. He was worshipped by offering offerings and participating in feasts. Another striking moment in the Bible when Baal considered the son of Dagon bowed before the living God was when Elijah made a public show of them before the people. Even though he is not specifically named by name, Dagon plays an important role in the book of Jonah. The Ninevites, who were of Assyrian origin, primarily honored Dagon, the god of fish, as well as Nanshi, a goddess associated with fish. When they had a prophet approach their gates who had lived in a fish for three days only to have been brought to them to tell them to repent of their ways, they were ready to listen. His temple is destroyed. His image is laid prostrate before the ark of God with his hands and face cut off, demonstrating that he is powerless to resist the God of the Israelites. And his creature, which is a fish, complies with the will of God by swallowing and spitting out a prophet who is on his way to Dagon's people to tell them to repent and turn back to the true God. We need to be cautious about what we allow to infiltrate our lives. The Bible doesn't really mention if the Israelites engaged in Dagon worship. However, we know they dabbled with Dagon's gods, Baal and Asherah so we can assume they threw a little Dagon in there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. Asherah was similar to many other idols in that he personified natural forces that had supposedly produced all things. Throughout history, and right into the days that we now live, humans have always been fascinated with demon-driven gods to do what looks extraordinary. This temptation hasn't been limited to the heathen without knowledge of God, but has also crept into the hearts of those who once loved and knew the God that made the unseen world. This longing to seek gods often stems from greed, rebellion, or a too impatient soul who feels God is too slow for the supernatural change he desires. Psalm chapter 16 verses 2 through 5 Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods, or take up their names on my lips. We need to be cautious about what we allow to infiltrate our lives. The seemingly innocuous can be insidious, so we must exercise extreme caution. Why is idol worship such a powerful temptation? The answer to this is sin. We worship modern idols because of our sinful nature. Resisting the glorification of idols is a battle of the redeemed. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 11 through 14 Put on the full armor of God, for his precepts are like the splendid armor of a heavily armed soldier, so that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. Therefore, put on the complete armor of God, so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger, and having done everything, that the crisis demands, to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. So stand firm and hold your ground, having tightened the wide band of truth, personal integrity, moral courage around your waist, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, an upright heart. When we hear the word idle, 
We usually think of statues and things reminiscent of those glorified by pagans in age-old cultures. However, the idols of the modern world often bear no likeness to the artifacts used thousands of years ago. In today's society, many people's Asherah has been replaced by an unquenchable desire for acceptance in the eyes of the world. In the end, it doesn't matter what empty pleasure we chase after or what idol or false god we bow down to. The result is the same. This is because there is only one god, and all other gods are false. Understanding contemporary idols can help us understand why they are a powerful temptation. Anything we place ahead of God in our lives can be an idol. Clearly, some of the things we idolize are sinful. Yet scripture tells us that, so then whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of our great God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31. Luke chapter 16 verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stand devotedly by the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon, that is, your earthly possessions or anything else you trust in and rely on instead of God. As we vigorously pursue our idols, we often push God aside. We rarely spend time with God because we spend so much on these idolatrous pursuits. We sometimes also turn to idols seeking solace from the hardships of life and the turmoil present in our world. Behaviors may be used to temporarily escape a challenging situation or the rigors of daily life. We need to place our trust in the Lord, who will keep us from all harm, and who has promised to supply all of our needs when we trust in Him. Psalm chapter 121 verse 7 The Lord will protect you from all evil, he will keep your life. We also need to remember the words of Paul, who teaches us not to be anxious about anything, but rather to pray about everything, so the peace of God which surpasses all understanding can guard our hearts and minds. Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 through 7. Do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God, and the peace of God, that peace which reassures the heart, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus is yours. The good things of this world are gifts from God meant to be enjoyed with a thankful heart, in submission to Him and for His glory. Nevertheless, when the gift replaces the giver, or the Creator replaces the Creator, we have fallen into idolatry. No idol can give us eternal hope or meaning in our lives. In pursuit of idols, we will be left empty, unsatisfied, and eventually on the road that leads to destruction. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads the way to destruction and eternal loss, and there are many who enter through it. God despises idolatry completely. It brings God's wrath down on those involved. Idolatry brings curses upon the people and the land. Exodus chapter 20 verse 5. Idolatry incites God's wrath. It defiles and pollutes people and the land. So, to answer the question, why are idols dangerous? Specifically, God's wrath is falling on idolatry. Nothing is more terrifying than the wrath of an all-powerful, all-righteous God. And according to Paul, 
God's wrath is coming on idolatry. God's wrath falls on the idolater because God is jealous. There are two kinds of jealousy, righteous and holy jealousy, and unrighteous, weak, and insecure jealousy. And God's jealousy is not only justified, He deserves our most profound and strongest affections and admiration. And if we find God to be so dull or insignificant that we must substitute other things that truly satisfy us more than He does, we offend Him and destroy ourselves. What exactly is an idol? And how does it appear today? First and foremost in the heart. Covetousness, which is idolatry, Paul says. Thus, idolatry today is the activity of the human heart. This is not a bodily act. Then there's a fruit on a branch. It all starts in the heart, craving, wanting, enjoying, and being satisfied by anything other than God. This is what Paul calls covetousness, a disordered love or desire, loving more than God which should be loved less than God, and only for God's sake. But this disordered heart is in a state of covetousness, which is an act of loving too much which should be loved less. Finally, what exactly is an idol? That is the issue. It is the thing or person that was loved more than God, desired more than God, treasured more than God, and enjoyed more than God. It might be good grades. It could be other people's approval. It could be a commercial success. It could be a hobby, a musical group, a sport, or your meticulously maintained yard. Your own appearance could be an idol. Anything could happen. So Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 1, verse 25. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature. Anything that is created rather than the creator. In closing, our question of the day is, which Bible character inspires you? Put your answers in the comments. Let us pray. Father, I am grateful for your overflowing grace that has brought me out of ignorance and darkness. Thank you for your love that has filled me with a knowledge of your will, to live with my Creator at the center of my life. I ask in the name of Jesus for your strength inside me so I can always make you my priority. As I do this, I know that the enemy's works will constantly be disgraced and the truth will reign. Amen.